I want to welcome you all to tonight's Writers at Grinnell event, our annual Mondo Montano Memorial Reading. Um, I welcome also and extend a welcome for the first time to our live stream on the Writers at Grinnell Facebook page. We have entered the 21st century at Grinnell. So for the alums and friends around the world, we miss you. Come back and visit and enjoy tonight's reading. My name is Dean Bacopoulos, and I'm co-director of Writers at Grinnell this year. Um, and I want to extend um, a very special welcome to a number of people. So I'm going to do some introductory comments, and then my colleague Ralph Savarese will come up to introduce tonight's featured presenter. Grinnell College is honored to host today's event in memory of a remarkable and talented Grinnellian. Armo, Armando Alters Montano, class of 2012, known to friends as Mondo, was a beloved figure on Grinnell's campus. He was a dedicated writer and editor on The Scarlet and Black, and we had a lovely dinner at our house last night with Mondo's parents and the staff of the SNB. Through his talent, energy, and considerable charm, Mondo managed to earn the respect of some of the country's leading journalists and media figures. Mondo was doing what he loved, serving an internship with the Associated Press in Mexico City when he died tragically only a few weeks after his graduation. Each year, I've tried to unearth a new memory about Mondo to share at this event and this year, as our campus collectively mourns the recent death of another wonderful soul gone too soon, Jack Gustafson, I want simply to offer my condolences to the students here tonight and to remind all of you gathered here this evening that good souls continue to speak to us after their death. We understand our memories of them in different ways as time passes. We learn things from them we didn't see before and we find their spirit in places we didn't expect. This certainly has been true for my relationship with Mondo. It somehow continues. I think of Mondo pretty much every day on this campus. And one of the things I've recently realized, <clears throat> this is a, every year this gets harder, it seems. One of the things I recently realized that I admired most about Mondo was his amazing capacity to live without shame. More than any person I have ever met, perhaps he seemed comfortable to be exactly the person he was. Mondo was unabashedly curious, hungry for human connection, proud to be a writer even when his writing was imperfect and honest about what he didn't know and eager to learn from anyone who was willing to teach. He allowed himself a kind of emotional vulnerability in his conversations, and yet walked through the world with a physical grace and ease. What a lovely sight it was to see him walking across campus in his short red shorts and his legalized gay t-shirt, earbuds in his ears, and route to dance class with a smile on his face that you could see clear across campus. This is the image of him I'll never forget, but it is also his legacy in many ways. Whenever I feel burdened by my own tendencies towards doom and gloom, I trudge from one meeting to the next and I can see him walking towards me, beaming, curious, and above all, happy to be here. His spirit, I think, is a great testament to the love he received from his friends, like Tessa Cheek, class of 2012, who is with us tonight, and his parents, Diane Alters, class of 71, and Mario Montano. Mondo's parents have generously created the Armando Alters Montano Writers at Grinnell Endowment Fund, and many generous donors, including many of Mondo's classmates and friends, have contributed to this growing fund. Each year, the fund will support the Armando Montano Memorial Lecture as a tribute to Mondo's dedication to nonfiction and fiction writing, journalism, and the creative process. 
I'm now happy to introduce my colleague, Chair of the English Department, Professor Ralph Severis, to present tonight's speaker. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I too would like to uh, acknowledge um, Diane and Mario and Tessa. Um, it's, it's a lovely event um, and it allows us to celebrate Mondo's memory and uh, allows us to remember why we're all here and giving so much to what we do. Um, so it's my great pleasure honor really to introduce tonight's reader, Stephen Cusisto. Um, but I also want to acknowledge, as Dean said, the generosity of Diane and, and Mario, and also a college buddy of mine from Wesleyan who donated very generously to the fund to make this reading possible in the short term. Um, uh, he gave $25,000 and then challenged us to raise $25,000. And of course, uh, we did that, and then he matched that twenty-five thousand. So um, I'm really, I'm really, um, I was really moved by this gesture um, by my friend. I sent him Mondo's story, and um, he just responded in a way that some people do, um, and sort of changed how you think of people in the world. If the writer's job is to present the world afresh then Stephen Cousisto offers the strongest argument conceivable for visual impairment as a fundamental requirement, indeed as the imagination's enabling engine. Listen to this description of being in a department store. Quote, I'm moving swiftly through abutments of stacked perfumes. We pass what must be a line of women's coats, to me, they seem like a herd of white deer, a chorus line of dancing egrets, end quote. Or listen to his description of seeing the Brooklyn Bridge. Quote, it occurs to me that my experience of the bridge is so completely cerebral, it is in fact an imaginary headdress, uh, like those body length hats worn by Tibetan women. In my version, the bridge falls, all, falls over me in layers of amethyst, gold, purple, and silver. These are the threads of being." End quote. Earlier in Planet of the Blind, the book from which these marvelous descriptions come, Cousisto wrestles with the paradoxical inheritance that his impairment provides, asking rhetorically, who would choose to be blind? and struggling to resist the impulse to try to pass as sighted. My ego crawls around blindness, he says, like a snail exploring a piece of glass. If the very instruments of poetry, metaphor and simile, are themselves visually impaired, presenting to the world a series of blurred distinctions, this is like that, then art, Cusiso discovers, is the most hospitable and habitable of spaces, a planet in his parlance where, quote, no one needs to be cured, where blindness is just another form of music, like the slow solo clarinet in the mind of Bartok. In the writings of Stephen Cousisto, we encounter a disability consciousness that exhorts the temporarily able-bodied to renounce their attachment to norms in favor of that much more generous of concepts, namely difference. His new book, Have Dog, Will Travel, A Poet's Journey with an Exceptional Labrador, just published by Simon & Schuster, presents the story of his first guide dog, Corky, with whom, he says mischievously, he has an arranged marriage. We will hear from that book tonight. Stephen Cousisto is the author of two acclaimed memoirs, Planet of the Blind, a New York Times notable book of the year, and Eavesdropping, a memoir of blindness and listening. He's also the author of two collections of poems, Only Bread, Only Light, and Letters to Borges. He's currently working on a novel about the Italian opera singer Enrico Caruso. His work has appeared in Harper's, the New York Times Magazine, Poetry, Partisan Review, and many other journals. 
He has appeared on numerous programs, including The Oprah Winfrey Show, Dateline MDC, National Public Radio, and the BBC. A graduate of the Writers' Workshop at the University of Iowa and a Fulbright Scholar, he teaches at Syracuse University, where he is a distinguished university professor. Please join me in welcoming Steve to Grinnell. Wow, I don't know that guy. <laughs> I want to meet him, though. This is Caitlin. She's a little bored. <laughs> She's had a long day. So if I magnify the living daylights out of this text, I can read it with one eye for a short period. Uh, often what I'll do is I'll put an earbud in my right ear and listen to the text and recite it, but that can be a little halting. And so I thought, well, let's try this. I could get lost, though, because once you magnify a text, it's a little... Uh, it's a little bit like being in the wrong corral with the horses running. Um, so this reference is a moment in my life when I uh, was going to have a home visit from a trainer from Guiding Eyes for the Blind, which is one of the nation's premier guide dog schools, a guy named David C. That was actually his name, David C. was going to come visit me to see if I was the right kind of guy to have a guide dog. And... Um, Anyway, he's about to come the next day, and I'm really on pins and needles about this. This is, I feel like I'm going to, it's like an adoption agency. It's, it's a test. It's everything. And uh, my mother, who was an alcoholic and very strange, uh, didn't want me to be blind, and, which is, you know, I mean, not really a useful worldview. And uh, so part of the story is how I kind of overcome this and decide, you know, I'm going to get a guide dog because I don't want to get run over. And not only that, I want to go places in the world and, and have a bigger life. And so this is from chapter four. The evening before Dave's visit, I talked with my mother who lived an hour west. There was a buzz on the phone line and she sounded drunk, though it was just dinner time. I'm getting a guide dog, I said. My voice was high and happy. In effect, I was a child saying, I'm getting a puppy. Oh, she said, I think that's a dreadful idea. Dreadful how, I asked. People will know you're on the fritz, she said. <laughs> on the fritz, I repeated. You mean like a household appliance? <laughs> yes, she said. <laughs> you should never let people see you're defective. They'll think less of you. I announced I was excited and said she should think about that. Then I hung up. <laughs> I had a Chinese herbalist neighbor who kept giving me chrysanthemum tea. Uh, I drank my chrysanthemum tea, chewed the blossoms, and understood my future dog shouldn't carry the burden of weak self-esteem. No dog should have to do that, I thought. My my parents were essentially decent people who'd survived the Great Depression. Both were working class kids and both went to college after the Second World War. My dad got his PhD in political science at Harvard in 1950. Having fought in the Pacific in the Army Air Corps, he told my mother, I need to learn how these damn things happen. In turn, my mother was accepted to law school in 1951, a true feat for any co-ed in those days, but instead she chose to raise a family. Later, the decision haunted her. She belonged to a larger world than the one offered by post-war domesticity. She became a housewife in Durham, New Hampshire, a college town, and became a hostess for faculty parties. Insert, insert, ugh. <laughs> no one knew how to confer about difficult or liminal subjects. Not talking became its own drama. As I grew up, I formed an anti-narrative. My parents' silence about my eyes sent me in two directions. One was physical and daring. The other was inward and bitter. When climbing trees or becoming the unchallenged king of hide-and-seek, I secretly knew I was the most deficient child alive. The feeling, however wrong, 
didn't get better as I grew older. If I'm going to get a guide dog, I thought, then I need to do more than just hit the gym. I needed to access my proper life, not academic life, not something from the Gospels. I would vanquish old embarrassments. As I set out on my dog journey, I knew it was time. When I was 12, my mother, who'd already become a heavy drinker, met me one afternoon as I came home. I'd hoped to find safety after seven hours of bullying in school. Instead, I found my mother clutching a smoldering sofa cushion in her arms. I don't know how I did it, she said. Get out of my way. She ran across the yard, holding the thing at arm's length, and for some reason she didn't drop it. She just staggered from place to place until flames singed her hair. Finally, she threw it into a neighbor's hedge where it sent up smoke signals. <laughs> that was a gradient point on the arc of withdrawal. My job was to endure by stamina, whether in school or at home. So blindness became a tortoise-like affair. My blind soul stayed quiet in its shell. My mother was generally drunk by mid-afternoon. Like most alcoholics, she had several modes of intoxication. There was a giddy, vaporous kind, born from merriment. Then there was a drunkenness forced by what I came to call her misery gauge. I pictured a glass indicator on a submarine. Pressure was building against the hull. She also engaged in vengeful drinking, the kind Nixon did as president. A mumbling paranoia. If I was lucky... She'd be asleep when I came home, stretched on the living room sofa with the curtains drawn, her highball glass on the floor, and one shoe off. I'd race to my room, lock the door, and strip off my torn shirt, for daily bullying always meant the death of a shirt. I'd lie on the rug and listen to the shortwave radio. There was a station from Belgium that played only Duke Ellington. Something in his music felt right to me. The Duke was complex, buoyant. I didn't know what to call it, but I always luxuriated in it. Because my father was an academic and moderately less guarded than my mother, who refused to talk about my eyes, he told a colleague just how little I could see. <laughs> One night, he came home with a large cardboard box containing a dozen sealed and labeled mason jars. His friend was a scientist of some kind, and the jars held dark specimens floating in formaldehyde. The idea was that I could hold the jars close to my one good eye and see things. Alone in a circle of lamplight, I held the first jar close to my face. A white human fetus floated in viscous brown liquid, trailing its umbilical cord. The jar was so near my left eye, my eyelashes brushed the glass, and owing to my shaking hands, the fetus turned gently, that gentleness of the drowned, until its face was straight opposite my cornea. It had gray veins across its temples and a determined frown. I thrust the jar back in the box. I wanted to go downstairs and tell my father to take it away, but he was fighting with my mother, and I, showed the, I shoved the whole collection into the back of my closet behind a heap of shoes. After that, I lay in bed, knowing the fetus was in my closet, <laughs> suspended in its soup with its little face all closed up. I wanted to grow my hair long like the Beatles guitarist George Harrison. In public, I was a mark. Boys stole my glasses, pushed me into walls, shoved me on the stairs, all because I was the deviant. I could feel their contempt all the way down to my spleen. Long hair would save me. <laughs> my mother was painfully drunk. You know the later George Harrison? He looked like Rasputin. It was great. It was a great look. Uh, my mother was painfully drunk when she called me for supper one evening. Before I knew it, she had me in an arm lock and was dragging me across the kitchen. You look like a fairy, she said. What's a fairy, I asked. I really had no idea. A faggot, she said. She was blowing whiskey vapor, clutching my hair, poking my skull with scissors. I pushed her. 
she fell backwards, waving her shears, and fell into the trash. Because she hated domesticity, she'd long ago decided a 30-gallon garbage can was perfect for the kitchen. You didn't have to empty it daily, and of course it stank, and then she was in it. I should say it's quite likely she'd have fallen into the trash without my help, as she was always unsteady on her feet, drunk or sober. The can tipped over as she fell, and the lid popped off, and together she and the can had a rendezvous, and there she was, covered with mire and ashes, and waving the pruning scissors and howling. She'd bruised her elbow. I was the inciting factor. In the weeks that followed, I was the one who ruined her elbow. With three months to go before guide dog school, I decided to attend Al-Anon meetings. <laughs> I wanted to be new, both inside and out. An offshoot of Alcoholics Anonymous, al is designed to help the families of drunks. A group of strangers, seven of us, sat around a scarred table in a community center in downtown Ithaca, New York. There were coffee cups at hand and ashtrays. A woman in her late 70s named Margaret, who'd once been an Atlantic fisherwoman and radiated competence, spoke up and recited lines from Ephesians. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you without all malice. Margaret looked up from her Bible and said, now ain't that the truth? We laughed. Everyone at that table had once lived with or was still living with a drunk. Each had bargained meager coins of the psyche while living with a dramatic, angry, and addicted person, and often more than one of them. Margaret's former husband was also a fisherman and a boisterous drunk who once stole a trolley filled with passengers when the motorman stopped to take a leak. The cops chased that streetcar for blocks while Bert sang filthy songs and demonstrated uncommon driving skills. They finally cut off the electricity and cornered him. <laughs> Some people said it was the best ride they'd ever had. <laughs> that was the thing. We all agreed. Drunks are vivid, manipulative, and dramatic. They can convince you of anything until being convinced becomes your job. So I told them about my blindness and how I'd lived according to my mother. Margaret and I reckoned that Bert and my mother would get along famously. Both believed in swashbuckling with whiskey and believed mind over matter makes the world go around. It was Margaret who said what should have been obvious. If I wasn't blind, then my mother wouldn't have anything to feel guilty about. Moreover, if I wasn't blind, if I never actually went anywhere, then I could look after her. It's the old love-hate dance all drunks waltz to, she said. Alcoholics love their own guilt, she added. It gives them reasons to keep drinking. So here I am now going to the guide dog school. I just get there, and this is sort of what the beginning of that was like. And, uh, you know, this is sort of like that Wizard of Oz moment. You know, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Uh, I've just catapulted. Uh, into the far side of a, of a universe I didn't know existed. So four months had passed since Dave C.'s visit. It was early March and snow was falling as I arrived at Guiding Eyes for the Blind in suburban Westchester County, a 40-minute drive north of New York City. Though my vision wasn't seriously reliable, I noticed the pleasant grounds with old trees, a white colonial house, and a neat brick dormitory, Nearby stood a veterinary hospital. Batting eyes looked like a small community college. You must be Steve, someone said as I stepped from the airport shuttle. I'm Linda, she said. Welcome. I'm one of the trainers. Great, I said. Is it okay if I admit I'm kind of nervous? Well, the dogs never bite, she said, laughing, but you never know about the trainers. <laughs> Come on, she said. I'll show you to your room. As we walked, Linda asked questions about my type of blindness. There are hundreds of blindnesses, and no two people experience vision loss the same way. Linda was asking, how is it for you? It's like I have Vaseline in my eyes, I said. Up close, pressing my nose on a printed page, I can read large print, but only with one eye. 
You know, there are so many variants of the low vision, no vision experience, Linda said. I'm amazed by every blind person who navigates this planet. It was such a simple thing to say, and yet I was truly warmed. There we were, the two of us, simply standing in a dormitory hallway, and for the first time in my life, someone had affirmed what it was like to be me. I'd been in the building 60 seconds. I remember John Prine's great folk song about aging. Hello in there. A person who didn't know me was acknowledging my existence. My room had a dog crate and a wall-mounted radio with oversized tactile buttons. There was a back door that opened onto a cement sidewalk where we'd be relieving our dogs when the time came. The dogs had been trained to do their business on cement, Linda said. Linda then left me to unpack. She said students and trainers would meet together in one hour. I thanked her, and after she left, I wrote a few lines in my journal. March 1, 1994. I have an hour to kill before the first group meeting. This is a good time to think about trust. (laughs) Trust probably has something to do with luck, as in making peace with it. I've grown up not thinking of luck. Like most Americans, I've imagined I'll get ahead by thinking my way forward. I think this might be a place where people know a lot about trust. Before arriving at guide dog school, I actually thought I'd be handed a dog who knew some commands, and that would be it. It would be simple. Looking back, if I'd known how much my life was about to change, I might have experienced some apprehension. I was going to be enlarged in several ways. All I knew for sure on day one was that I'd made a commitment. At our first group meeting, I saw we were old and young, American and Israeli, men and women, northern and southern. Some of us were kids straight out of high school. We were black and white, Latina. One of us was very tall. Four of us had already had a guide dog. The rest were newbies. Everyone was chatting. The simmer of talk was pleasing. We were Tina, Mike, Aaron, Joseph. We were Harriet, Doug, Constance, Sally, Jeff, Anna, Bill, and Steve. The trainers were Linda and Kylie and Hank and Brett. We were drawn together not just by blindness, but also because training with a guide dog is about the future. Linda called the meeting to order. She said, let's talk about dogs. Let's let's talk about how tomorrow is going to unfold. Oh boy, dogs, someone said. Everyone laughed. Linda turned to trainer Kylie and said, I don't know, do you think we have any dogs here? (laughs) I think I saw one, said Kylie. Probably a stray, Linda said. Okay, jokes aside, said Linda. Tomorrow we'll ask each of you to take a walk with us. The trainers will pretend to be guide dogs. Our goal is to get a sense of your walking gait, your speed, and what kind of pull is comfortable for you. She explained there were multiple dogs in waiting, dogs all trained up and ready to go. There were 24 dogs for 12 students. Just as no two human beings are alike, no two dogs are the same, Linda said. Part of a trainer's job is matchmaking, she said, knowing which dog will fit each and every one of you. In the morning, we'll walk the grounds of the school. Trainers will move fast and pull the front end of a dog harness, and you're going to hold uh, the handle and pretend you're walking a real dog. I wasn't sure what I thought about walking around with a pretend guide dog. Somehow it seemed embarrassing, oddly performative. But my comfort wasn't as important as my safety in ultimately getting the right dog, this much I knew. At eight the next morning, I stood beside a fountain with Kylie, who was ready to be my dog. I was going to walk a harnessed woman around a parking lot. (laughs) Once in college, a friend persuaded me to help him walk about in a donkey suit. We were going to perform at a children's fair. My job was to hold up the back end. It would be perfect, my friend said. I didn't have to see, just keep myself upright. Of course, the problem was my friend couldn't see either. The eye slits kept shifting. We stumbled into a trash can. We walked over a beach blanket and broke a toy. I grasped my friend's arm. He staggered. I laughed so hard I fell out of the donkey and lay on the grass. Look, someone said, the donkey has given birth to an idiot. (laughs) I thought, 
Okay, I can be the back-end fool. When I'm a good dog, you're going to tell me, said Kylie. When I'm a bad dog, you're going to give me a correction with this leash. She showed me the leash. <laughs> this is really probably the most embarrassing moment of my life. Uh, <laughs> how will I know when you're a bad dog? I asked. <laughs> I'll stop when we're supposed to be walking because I want to sniff the grass, she said, or I'll veer off the path. And what do I do with the leash? You're going to give it a tug and you're going to say, no, hup up, hup up, yes, hup up. What does that mean? I asked. It's an old guide dog command. It tells your dog to refocus, kind of like a reset button. Exactly. Does it mean anything else? I asked. Yes, it can mean it's time to go faster. She went on to explain that when she stopped for curbs or steps, I should praise her. For the purpose of the exercise, her imaginary dog name was Juno. All the guide dog schools use, use the name Juno for this exercise, she said. There's no real guide dog named Juno. Juno, I thought. Roman goddess of war, fertility, and youth. It was one of those throwaway thoughts. Juno... Juno, make me young. Are you ready, she asked. Okay, I said, let's go. We walked and Kylie pulled with steady force. A real guide dog, she said, will pull. They're not like pets trained to heal. The pull allows your dog to have fluid movement as you're walking. She'll see an obstacle and guide you around it without breaking stride. You'll also learn during training that the pull creates a trust factor. Yes, I thought, trust my weakest area. Good dog, Juno, I said as Kylie stopped at a curb. Now you're going to tell her to go forward, Kylie said. Juno, forward, I said. Off we went. We veered and zigged and zagged. I said, hup up when Kylie turned toward a flower bed. We recommenced our little journey. When our Juno walk was over, Kylie said I had a good handling technique. I had no idea what this meant. She also said I was a speedy walker. That night, I wrote in my journal, can trust be taught? Is trust related to embarrassment? Maybe I should have risked more embarrassment in my life. Tomorrow is dog day. By the second day, I'd come to see Guiding Eyes as a sailing vessel. It was a contained and intense place. We were on the ocean together, trainers, students, and dogs. At 6 a.m., the intercom crackled. It was time to hit the deck. There'd be a morning class, and then in the afternoon, we'd be given our dogs. I stumbled around my room. I hit my head on the bathroom door. I rubbed my brow and thought, even with a poor start, this was a different day from all others. It was dog day. Dog day. I thought, dog day, I thought, is like getting married, but it's so, it's an arranged wedding. The bride and groom don't know each other. Our first class was about technique. Everyone received a stiff leather leash. We learned how to use brass clips and rings to make it long or short. The short leash said Linda, the short leash said Linda is for working dogs in harness. You'll learn more about this tomorrow. The short leash is kind of like a dog's throttle and brake. The long leash is for potty breaks or letting your dog sniff the grass. We practiced making our leashes long and short. We learned the proper command to encourage a dog to relieve itself. Get busy. It felt silly to say it, but we did. Guide dogs, said Linda, will get busy on pavement or cement. They don't need grass. Now we need to talk about your dogs, Kylie said. Later on this afternoon, each of you will be united with your dog. Remember, this will be as powerful and beautiful for her as it is for you. When we release her, you're going to call. She'll be excited. She may come straight to you, or she might run in circles before she comes. She's been in a kennel for months, wake, working each day with her trainer. Today will be something new for her as well. By the way, Kylie said, I'm using her when speaking of the dogs, but half the dogs in this class are male. There is absolutely no quality distinction between the genders. Both male and female guide dogs are equally good at their jobs. 
Linda added, all the dogs in the class are Labrador retrievers. Some are black labs, some are yellow. There's no difference between them. In fact, they occur in the same litter of puppies. Some dogs are big, some are smaller. Again, there's no difference. Don't compare your dogs, said Linda. Your dog won't be better because it has a longer tail than your neighbor's dog. This is a group activity requiring encouragement. Well, I thought, here's where a guide dog school isn't like the Navy. No admiral describes a flotilla as a matter of encouragement. The next three and a half weeks will be stressful, engaged, tiring, and even thrilling. But the goal behind everything we do is to see that you and your new dog become a superb team. Your dogs need encouragement, and so do you. And you should give it to each other, Linda said. I thought of lines from Dickens' Oliver Twist. For the rest of his life, Oliver Twist remembers a single word of blessing spoken to him by another child because this word stood out so strikingly from the consistent discouragement around him. A single word of blessing, I thought. A single word of blessing. The trainers shifted gears. Now we're going to tell you the name and color of your dog, said Kylie. The dogs were named at birth, and each litter of puppies receives a letter of the alphabet. Every dog in the litter has a name beginning with the designated letter, said Linda. Some of the names are a bit unusual, said Kylie. We name a lot of dogs. In other words, don't get wigged out about your dog's name, said Linda. Your dog likes her name. The names of our soon-to-be dogs were read aloud. The names were at once splendid and silly. Tinsel, Abby, Norway, Tammy, Henry, Whisper, Captain, Johnny. I was amazed by the silly nature of the names. Who'd have, a, who'd have thought a hero dog would be named Whisper? Steve, your dog is a yellow lab named Corky, said Kylie. Corky, I thought. Wasn't there a killer whale named Corky? <laughs> it seemed both carefree and tough. Perhaps that's how we'd be together. Our dogs were going to have baths, Linda said. Then we'd be united with them one by one. I waited in my room and imagined a map, a might-be map of life to come. What if the future would be okay? What if it would be truly lovely. What if having a guide dog worked for me? I saw these were the proper things to think about. And then my name was called via loudspeaker, and it was my turn to meet Corky. I grabbed the leash and walked to the lounge. Corky burst in like a clown. I sat in a tall armchair, and Kylie told me to call and damned if she didn't run full steam into my arms. She placed her large front paws on my shoulders and washed my face. And then, as if she fully understood her job would require comedy, she nibbled my nose. She was brilliant and silly, and I, I couldn't believe my luck. Back in our room, she bounced, cocked her head, backed up, ran in circles, and came back. All the while, I kept talking. Oh, let's go any place we choose, I said, feeling I was on the verge of tears. As our first hours unfolded, we began the lifelong art of learning to read each other. She was happy, but she had something else, a quality of absorption. She looked me over like a tailor. She took me in. She wasn't searching for a ball to be thrown. Was it my imagination, or did she actually have the most comprehending face I'd ever met? There are times when you can't describe your feelings. You say, so this is the new life. I thought, so this is the new man with the big dog, the big yellow dog who cares not a whit about the old man's history and already believes in his goodness. All right, I'm going to read just a little more here. Bear with me. So I'm now walking with the dog in a city for the first time, right? Then Kylie came and said it was my turn, our turn. It was Corky's moment. She'd show me what she could do. I'd show her I wasn't afraid. 
There is even a moment in the very beginning when you have to jump across a precipice. We hurried past storefronts, corky pulled, and I concentrated on my breathing, trying to stay loose. My arm was straight, my shoulders squared, my posture upright. In lecture, it had sounded so easy, but now I was moving very fast. I was scared and joyous. Kylie was behind us monitoring. We were stepping out, as they say, in guide dog work. Corky was going so swiftly. I didn't have time to worry about oncoming shadows, people, street signs, whatever they were. They just dropped behind us. I'd always been a tippy-toe walker. Now I was putting everything into my feet, and for the first time I felt vital in relation to my footfalls. It was a circumstance for which I had no prior lingo, a dog-driven invitation to living full forward. Racing up the sidewalk, we were forwardness itself. Then Corky hit the brakes, firmly. She'd arrived at our first curb. God, I thought, she's doing what the trainers said she'd do. Then she backed up slightly. The harness, the well-known guide dog accoutrement, is perfectly rigid. Its handle is a steel fork with a skin of leather. As your dog moves, you move. I felt safe at the curb. Earth will be safe, said the Buddhist teacher, Tik Nhat Han, when we feel in us enough safety. Nice stop, said Barbara, a trainer, stationed just a few feet away. That's our corky girl. And she'll always do that, I said. It was half a question, half an exclamation. Yep, said Barbara. She'll always do that. Block two came next. We stepped out again. Corky guided, watching, looking a block ahead. Man, I thought, I could let go of all my panic. All my fighter flea guesswork walks might just be a thing of the past. Corky's harness jingled. Her harness actually jingled. A man called out, That's a great-looking dog, and you look pretty good, too. <laughs> Thanks, I said. So do you. I was feeling good <laughs> and more than a little proud. We walked another block. Again, Corky came to a stop. We were at the corner of Mamaronek Avenue and Martine, a tough intersection, urban, lots of cars, Metro New York drivers. It certainly wasn't Ithaca. It was all a blur of motion. Corky tracked movement like a predator. I felt her shoulders sway as she looked from side to side. Dogs track movement better than people and have a wider visual field. A Labrador retriever sees 250 degrees while staring straight ahead. A human being sees only 180. Without turning her head, a dog can see a car with her peripheral vision, even if it's still a block away. She sees fields of action. It's a dog's version of cubism, a cubist cartoon, each zone filled with activity. Standing on the corner of Mamaronek and Martine, I imagined what Corky might be seeing. As I listened, she saw a skateboarder weaving from 85 degrees right. From our left, she saw a taxi encroaching the crosswalk and ready to accelerate. In the middle distance on the far side, a man with a hot dog stand struggled to raise an umbrella. Far off, 100 yards away, she saw a motorized street sweeping machine churning up dust. Listen to the traffic going with you, said Barbara, who was just behind us. I'd forgotten she was there. I liked the fact she was nearby, but wasn't intrusive. Then the traffic began flowing, and it was our turn to cross. I commanded Corky forward. Most people think guide dogs are responsible for deciding when to cross the street, but it's not true. The dog watches traffic. This is why she differs from a family pet. Guide dogs possess a trait called intelligent disobedience. A blind person hears traffic and decides when to cross, but a guide won't budge if her handler has made a bad choice. She may, in fact, back up. So when you enter the crosswalk, you can count on a safe crossing. I said forward, and we entered the no-man's land of a crosswalk, where a line of impatient cars emitted exhaust. Corky zipped. Before I could think, we were at the far curb. As I found the sidewalk with my foot, Barbara reminded me to praise her. 
I was so wrapped in wonder, I was forgetting to say, good dog. Love her up, said Barbara. Though it wasn't in the lesson plan, I dropped to my knees and hugged my big yellow Labrador and told her, I'm sorry, I dropped to my knees and hugged my big yellow ox-headed Labrador girl and told her she was the best thing ever. Then I laughed because I was neither here nor there, not the old blind guy and not quite the new, but I was happy. Phase one of trust, laughing. How much time do I have? A few more minutes to read or? You gotta tell me. Five more minutes? Okay. All right. So I'm talking with some blind people at the guide dog school. They're all training with their dogs and we're having this really amazing conversation. And uh, I, I think you might enjoy this part. So uh, I'm talking to all these uh, blind people here. Aaron was working on a PhD in languages. He'd been silent for the first few days, but now he was warming up. So he said, you're in a restaurant and 12 other folks, strangers all, are eyeing you because you're significantly different. Sighted people enjoy novelty and you're the novelty du jour, du jour. Even if you're just chewing a muffin, you're entertainment. And then a stranger can't resist and approaches and says, I knew a blind person once. <laughs> oh God, yeah, said Tina. There's some nuance to this, said Aaron. The stranger once knew a blind guy in college or a blind person who lived down the street. Sometimes he'll ask if I actually know the aforementioned blind person because after all, shouldn't all blind people know one another? You're swallowing the damn muffin and you think, what if I asked if he knows all businessmen who wear London fog raincoats? Now you're in a fix, said Aaron. The stranger's invitation to chat is also a signal to you, the blind one, to say moderately inspirational things. <laughs> or in turn, the stranger says upbeat shit like, I knew a blind guy once who could take apart a radio and put it back together. Aaron continued, he knew a blind guy who climbed a mountain. He knew a blind guy who went skydiving, who caught more fish than the rest of them combined. And you want to say, I knew a short guy once. I knew a short guy who could reach the peanut butter on a shelf with a special device called a stepladder. He was amazing. <laughs> Faux disability heroism, I thought, is like every other kind of American hero worship. If one size fits all is the United States universal motto, then surely any distinguishing quality makes a man or woman remarkable. I knew a guy who could eat more hot dogs than anyone in Peoria. I knew a woman who ate spiders to amuse her children. <laughs> in the United States, anyone curious is refreshing. I didn't say this. I heard their proper frustration. Can a blind person just be customary, I thought? Judging by what Aaron had to say, the answer was no. I don't put down stray-sighted people who ask me dumb questions, Aaron continued. It is better to be polite. Sometimes I use my dog as a ploy and say, I've got to go. The dog needs to take a piss. <laughs> anyway, said Aaron, I don't talk about blindness. There are agencies for that. I tell people I want to talk about neutrinos. One thing's for certain, said Harriet, who'd been listening and combing her dog. You're a celebrity with a guide dog. People always approach you. Well, I'm not sure I'll mind that, I said, then added, I like the small, sensible faces of life. No one knew precisely what to say to that. There was a brief silence. Then Aaron said, well, you're a poet, but don't let strangers talk you to death. <laughs> Listening to them, I wondered if I'd have a problem with strangers. My principal hang up had always concerned accomplishment, a misunderstanding of accomplishment, as if blindness was an obstacle to success. I'd lived without any examples of blind triumph. Now triumph was all around me. The other students were skilled at living with their disability. Maybe Aaron didn't like talking with intrusive people, but he was in the world and could live as he wished. I resolved not to care too much about curious strangers. In a way, questions might be a relief after living so long with blindness as a largely unspoken element of my life.
job. Let's see. I, I will um, give us a little bit of time for questions. So uh, I know some of you are at the round table this afternoon, but if you would like to ask a question, and listen, I will be around with the mics. If Because we are um, live streaming this on Facebook, if you don't mind standing, if you're able, when the question, um, when you ask a question, it would make the filming easier if you're able and willing to stand. If not, that's okay, but we'd love you to stand if you are able. Any um, questions? Yes. You must have read Homer, I assume. Yes. So uh, my question is, do you and that Homer is pretty that, good, yeah. by the way. I just, that you know. comparison often, does it come <laughs> up often? And how has reading his work influenced yours? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, Homer uh, is quite possibly the most vital storyteller among poets, you know, and uh, his capacity to describe certain elements of landscape and elements of Greek life tends to indicate that he was probably sighted as a young man. And in Greek, in the Greek world, uh, the, certainly the, the early Hellenic world, um, it was the elderly who were blind for the most part. So I'm guessing that he had a capacious memory and so that when he was blind later, he could recount absolutely everything. Which, by the way, is part of the epic poet's job. Because one of the things the epic poet has to do is to describe to the, to the civilization how to be a good Greek or a bad Greek. An exemplary uh, citizen, right? And that meant everything. How to build a boat, how to dress, how to fight how to anchor a ship. Other questions? Um, I was wondering about, because you mentioned David C. And so there's a certain level of irony to that, which seems pretty obvious to a reader. But is there a point? <laughs> at which you include certain levels of irony that you feel need to be more explicit in saying like, hey, uh, reader, pay attention, this is like ironic, because it's kind of hard sometimes in my own writing to kind of paint something as ironic when I think it's ironic, but yeah, other people might yeah, not yeah. get the reference. Yeah, yeah. No, there are so many types of irony, right? I mean, some are just the uh, extraordinary aleatoric accidental ironies. Like a guy from the guide dog school is named David C. You know, that's hilarious. Uh, and you can't plan on that one, right? But then there are the ironies that, you know, come to your rescue because of the fertility of your own imagination that can help you in all kinds of settings, right? Uh, particularly comic irony, which is where you realize that you now know more than you did even 10 minutes ago or a decade ago or a week ago, right? And you can bring to bear on a situation, what you know now, right? And, uh, and so that's a kind of irony that's rather delicious in nonfiction, right? I think the memoir can't exist without that. Uh, if it doesn't have that kind of comic irony where you reveal what you know now versus what you, you know, did not know before, then you're just writing a kind of Hollywood kiss and tell book and it's not literary at all. Literary memoir depends on that irony. Other questions? And yes, the Boston Red Sox are beating the Yankees right now. I'm very happy, in case you wanted to know. Um, hi, I, um, I, was, I was struck by that quote um, uh, from, from your reading about how um, you, you, you meet your dog and, and there's a moment um, where you feel essentially good. I, I, won't, I won't get that exactly right. And it reminded me that there's a whole body of, of dog literature, which is, which, um, is, is different, different from your book in, in some ways. But I wondered if you could speak to your relationship to, to a dog, which, um, which is in, 
in, in lit and, and all over the place. Like people have such special, intense relationships to their dogs, guide or, or not. Well, the reason that the subtitle of this book is A Poet's Journey is because uh, working with this dog daily, hourly, in all kinds of environments, in 47 states and multiple foreign countries, working with a dog who saved my life multiple times, the closeness that I achieved with her was extraordinary. And moreover, I believe, I joked on Iowa Public Radio yesterday, but I believe that, uh, that Corky made me a better writer because she opened up the possibilities for getting lost, for being curious, for being spontaneous, for just simply doing something on a whim. And of course, to be a writer is to really relish and glory in, uh, in, in experience. And that was something that I did not know how to do before her. So I, I really think that in this case, uh, a dog was my, you know, was my tutor in multiple ways, both practical and spiritual. Uh, dogs, compared to humans, have a very limited lifespan. Yes. And they get, they get old and sick like humans do, only much sooner. Yes. Have, have you written about that part of the relationship? And yes. The end of this book is about her death. And I wrote it in a way that would make Dickens proud. It's the death of little Nell. No, it's brutal. It's very painful. And I've said goodbye now to three guide dogs. And uh, I can't bring myself to scatter their ashes. I have them all in urns uh, on my mantle. And uh, yeah, it's rough. It's rough. Um, I uh, hold Corky's urn with her ashes in my arms at the end of the book, and I'm sitting under a tree, and I'm disconsolate, and, uh, and then I have this moment where I ask, well, what would she want for me? And this is a dog who spent every moment of her life, you know, uh, joyously engaging with me and going places. What would she want? And the answer was very clear, that she'd want me to keep moving. Um, I'm not a brave person necessarily, uh, but uh, when Corky had a brain tumor and had to be put to sleep, I was uh, about to come apart. And I realized as she was lying there on the gurney in the vet's office that if I began to cry, she would die in distress. And so I held her and sang to her as she died. We had a little walking song that we sang. And... Uh, that was something I could do for her. All right, well, thanks everybody. I'm gonna sign a few books if anybody wants to buy one. Steve will be signing books in the back. Thank you, one more round of applause for Steve, that's beautiful.